Well, good afternoon, everyone. As well as the Health and Social Care Minister, today I am pleased to have with us the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, Dr Alex Allenson, Dr Henrietta Hewitt, our Director of Public Health, who is becoming a regular and popular guest, and last but not least, Linda Thompson, who is our Clinical General Manager for Children, Women and Families at the Department of Health and Social Care. Today I would like to cover two important and emotive issues. The first being the return of our residents and secondly schools. Before we get into these areas, I would like to invite the Minister for Health and Social Care to cover today's statistics. And I know that the Minister also wants to address a couple of issues that came up over the weekend. So how, over to you David. Thank you Chief Minister. The total number of tests undertaken now stands at 3,807. The total number of tests returned is 3,770, leaving outstanding 37 tests. There have been no new cases confirmed today, so that leaves the total number of cases at 330, and, that mean, and active cases remain at 37. One of the issues I want to address is we've been getting a lot of queries in relation to childcare for those returning to work. Childcare is covered by Section 51R2 of the Prohibition of Movement Regulations. So childcare can take place by family members for the purpose of someone going to work, but only for the purpose of someone going to work. That means physically going out to work, not related to home working. Children have to be dropped door to door and collected door to door and any accompanying adult can't enter the other household. Also, it's care at home, so not a social opportunity to go to the park, etc. Equally, for clarity, childcare should not be undertaken by any family member who is self-isolating or has received a shielding letter. Thank you, Chief Minister. And thank you very much, David, for clarifying that position. I will hand over to the Education Minister in a second, but before I do so, I need to update you on the repatriation scheme for our residents. This morning, the Council of Ministers considered the final details of changes to this scheme. We have now agreed that, though, that for those returning residents who meet and can prove they meet certain criteria, then they can, from Wednesday the 13th of May, now go through a system of home quarantine, rather than the quarantine at the Comis Hotel. The full details of the new procedures will be published on our website shortly, and we are currently contacting those booked to return on Wednesday and those are currently in the Comis who will be affected. The headlines of the new process are People should be able to quarantine in their own accommodation, i.e. not shared with any other people, unless it is people they are returning with. If they are not able to do this, they can quarantine somewhere else, for example a hotel or in a self-catered apartment accommodation. This will need to be approved by government. People returning under the scheme will not be allowed to go outside at all for the full 14 days the only exception will be to go out into personal, not shared, garden spaces in the agreed quarantine accommodation. Those returning will need to evidence that they have a network available to support the supply of food, for example, while in quarantine. The Department of Health and Social Care will issue legal directions that detail the requirements around quarantine and the penalties in place those returning will have to confirm that they have understood the obligations on them. The Council of Ministers this morning also agreed that the repatriation numbers of around 30 a week will, for the moment at least, be maintained to continue to mitigate the increased risk. We also agreed that the number of sailings would continue to be weekly and from Haitian only. We are not ready to approve any other routes at this stage. Those returning will continue to be given a health check in the United Kingdom prior to sailing. From Wednesday, 
any residents who are part way through a 14-day quarantine at the Comus will be able to leave and complete their quarantine at home provided they too meet the criteria. They will only pay for the actual period of their stay with the remainder being refunded where it's needed to be. As always, and I know you've heard this from me a hundred times, these arrangements will be subject to regular reviews. If evidence suggests that these amended measures are increasing risk to our community, we are ready to change them. And I need to make clear a few issues that I know have been on people's minds about this move to home quarantine. This is not the start of an erosion of our border measures. Our borders remain closed. Residents returning will be made 100% clear of their legal obligations. These, like other laws in place to protect people during this pandemic, will be enforced by the police. I would now like to move on to the question of schools. I know this is an emotive issue and we are trying to hit a difficult balance. We want to ensure that any return to school is safe for our teachers and our children. We also recognise the need to ensure that our children's education does not suffer more than it needs to. There is of course also the question of children returning to school being important to those people who may be able themselves to return to work. The Council of Ministers has been clear that we want to get this right, not rushed. I would therefore like to hand over to the Minister for an update and a look ahead. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Chief Minister. Good afternoon. Around the world, there are rays of hope now showing. Due to your actions and determination, our island has managed to drastically reduce the spread of the virus. But despite our best efforts, people have become ill and some have tragically lost their lives. The Isle of Man government is more than aware of the costs of the actions we've taken together for you and your families. People have lost their jobs, have suffered financially, businesses have folded, and some now face an uncertain future. Others have had to deal with the stress of not being able to see loved ones, of having to work from home, or having to deal with self-isolation or shielding from harm. Many children are starting their eighth week away from school, separated from their teachers and classmates, and having to make sense of a very different world than any of us expected. We know the strain this is, be, this is placed on our young people and their families. Children who were not seen as vulnerable are now. That is why last week's publication of the Stay Safe strategy was so important. It showed how we as a nation can gradually adjust the current restrictions and emerge out of the recent darkness. A key component of the next phase is to allow more children to come back to school. This has to be managed in a gradual and carefully calculated way. But it is vitally important that parents are confident that allowing their children to return to school is safe. We know from international studies that children often remain asymptomatic if they contract coronavirus and rarely become unwell. There is good evidence that they do not significantly add to the spread of the virus within our community. And often they seem to catch the virus from adults rather than from each other. So as a government, we have to balance these facts to ensure that our children's education and perhaps their future does not become another victim of coronavirus. We are not the United Kingdom. Early on in this health emergency, we continued community testing, contact tracing, and brought in border controls and quarantine. We have expanded on-island testing and now have a strategy in place to test all symptomatic key workers or members of their family. This will include teachers and other educational staff. We have devised policies for enhanced cleaning of schools, physical distancing, extra hand washing and hygiene measures, and an island-wide policy of staff for staff regarding masks and other form of personal protective equipment. There are logistical challenges to welcoming more children into our schools, but with the right support and backup, we can do this together. I would now like to ask our Director of Public Health, Dr Hewitt, to say a little bit more about steps underway to make our schools as safe as possible. Thank you, Dr Hewitt. Thank you.
thank you. Uh, you've given the broad outline of the, the steps underway already in terms of looking at how risks can be assessed in individual school buildings um, and with individual classes and year groups uh, to bring in social distancing as far as possible, both in the actual classroom and also in common areas. That might include things like thinking about a one-way system, staggering when different classes change periods in the timetable so that classes aren't mixing up when they, they pass through shared corridor areas. Uh, similar approaches would be taken around things like queuing for meals um, and managing playground access. And of course, alongside that needs to go um, regular hand washing opportunities, uh, being careful about cleaning down sanitizing surfaces regularly and maintaining high levels of respiratory hygiene as well as hand hygiene. Thank you, Dr. Ewart. It's clear that there are challenges ahead, but this week work is underway on more detailed risk assessments in our schools on enhancing hygiene measures and planning for a gradual return of pupils. Communication is key. We need to work together across government to address issues regarding, to, regarding teaching, catering, cleaning, transport and social support. That is why I'm pleased to announce the recreation of the Industrial Relations Forum which will bring all the main unions and staff representatives together to fight this virus on a common front, to work together for you and our island. But despite the restrictions and limitations we have faced, essential services have continued. I would like to invite Linda Thompson, who is the Clinical General Manager for Children, Women and Families, to tell us the important work that is going on to protect the young and most vulnerable in our community. Thank you, Minister. The Care Group for Women, Children and Families has been working tirelessly to continue to deliver services for the island that are both safe and child-focused. This is inclusive of maternity services, paediatric, health visiting, school nursing, safeguarding and CAMS. Concerns were highlighted at the start of the pandemic that children may be viewed as super spreaders, which was linked to the influenza studies. However, this has not been proven for COVID. As positive as this appears, it is essential that social distancing is adhered to. This is a key message that must be acknowledged if we are to continue to reduce the spread of COVID. It is really important to acknowledge that to date, the symptoms for children presenting with COVID have been mild and in small numbers. No children have required admission to the children's ward or transfer to off-island units. If this was required, please be assured that mechanisms are in place. The children's ward is fully prepared and is currently functioning as two separate wards, suspected COVID and non-COVID related admissions. PPE guidance is being adhered to and social distancing is being followed. In going forward, the message to all parents, carers has not changed. If you are concerned for a child's health, you should contact the appropriate professionals, GP, health visitor or emergency department. The paediatric team of nurses and doctors are fully functioning within Nobles and the community. We do not want you to be fearful if concerned, please act appropriately. There have been changes to service delivery to ensure everyone's safety. Our community paediatric outreach nurses are undertaking home visits and community clinics where required. Our consultant paediatric teams are continuing to function, offering telephone consultations and where necessary one-to-one -one planned clinic attendances. Health visiting and school nursing are, deliver, are delivering a reduced service which is focusing on new births, maternal health and safeguarding children. We are working alongside our multi-agency multi colleagues to meet the holistic care needs of our children on the island. We acknowledge that specialist services are required for children and our colleagues within CAMS and social care are supporting our care plans. Midwifery services continue, albeit very differently. Telephone consultations, community clinics and early discharge all contacts are risk assessed to protect both patients and staff. In going forward, it is essential that services are delivered safely. We acknowledge that we can only be successful if we continue to work in partnership. I would like to say thank you to all of you for assisting in the changes to the delivery of services that have been imposed upon us all. Without your acceptance and understanding over this difficult period, we would not have successfully achieved the outcomes to date. Thank you.
Thank you, Linda, and for everything you and your colleagues are doing to keep us safe. The Early Years team and Registration Inspections team are gathering feedback from and working with nurseries, playgroups and childminders in order to provide further guidance and support as they plan to reopen when they are ready or gradually increase the numbers of children attending their settings if they have remained open for vulnerable children and those of key workers. The most vulnerable children will be prioritised. Childcare is vital and as we adjust to the new Stay Safe agenda we need to start expanding the provision of services for working families. I would like to thank all those who work in our nurseries, our childminders, teachers, special unit staff and cleaners, catering staff and caretakers for their work and care over the past difficult weeks. I would also like to thank our head teachers for their advice and leadership over the last seven weeks for the work they have done to teach and support children at home and reassure and protect those pupils and members of their own staff who have had to self-isolate. Everything that can be done will be done to make our schools safe. Now is the time to move forward to reclaim the education of our children and start the slow, careful process of opening up our schools. This will not be done with haste and every step will be with a view to the current health situation and the safety of everyone. If your child can stay at home, they should stay at home. But our first step will be to, to support the children of parents in the construction, trades and horticulture se sectors. If you need your child to return to school, please contact your head teacher this week so that they can discuss your needs and start planning how they can be accommodated. Once we know the number of children who need school, we can complete the arrangements to welcome them back. This is the start. The next phase will be to invite those from years two and six back to their primary schools and years 10 and 12 back to their secondary schools. All this will take careful planning and can be delayed at any time if the health situation changes on our island. But with the dedication and enthusiasm I have seen in our teaching profession over the last two months, I know we will succeed together. Thank you, and I would like, now like to hand back to the Chief Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, and I found, I hope you found, all found that very useful. Thank you very much, Alex. We will continue to keep you informed as the situation develops. Before I move to questions, I would like to give some initial reactions to the United Kingdom Prime Minister's statement last night. Much of what the Prime Minister has announced will have been familiar to people here on the Isle of Man. People in the United Kingdom will now be able to leave their homes without the need for activity to be essential. As for other changes to the United Kingdom measures, the speech was, as the Prime Minister described it himself, a first sketch of a road map of what the future may look like. He suggested that June might see a phased reopening to schools and shops and that July may see some hospitality returning. While of course of interest to us, the changes to the United Kingdom measures do not change our own decision making. We will continue to make Manx decisions and find Manx solutions for our Manx situation. One aspect of the announcement that I know caught the attention of people here was when the Prime Minister said he was serving notice and that it would be soon be time to impose a quarantine requirement on people arriving into the United Kingdom. Now there are a number of details still being worked on at the UK end and we are of course in touch with them on this. What is clear so far is that people arriving into the United Kingdom from other parts of the common travel area, so the Republic of Ireland, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, will be exempt. Just in case there is any confusion here, this is a United Kingdom decision about people arriving into the United Kingdom. This does not affect our own processes for people arriving into the Isle of Man. Those processes are ours. As I said earlier in this press conference, we keep our measures under constant review. But for the moment at least, I cannot envisage a return to an unhindered flow of people between the United Kingdom and the Isle of Man happening any time soon. I will now take questions. 
And first I have is Chris Cave from Energy FM. Chris. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. My first question to uh, Dr. Allenson, if possible, please. OK. Alex. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Allenson. Um, first of all, uh, on your announcements uh, today, uh, my internet was a bit shaky. There. Is there a date set in stone yet? Do you think that there's been a big carbine for sending certain businesses and employees back to work? Uh, so is there one in the pipeline for when schools will start to welcome back more pupils? Well, thank you very much for, for that question. We have been working with all the teachers and their representatives in terms of a phased return. And we're trying to do that really based on the educational needs of, of the children. So as I said, initially we're looking at trying to support those families in the various um, sectors that went back to work. But after that, we will be looking at some of the key year groups, particularly years two and six and years 10 and 12, where, who are in the cru crucial period of their education at the moment. Each stage will need to be determined very much by what the health situation is at, at the time. Also making sure that we have the right numbers of staff and the logistics to support those people coming back to schools. But we're hoping to bring this in in an orderly manner over the next couple of weeks so that we can actually make sure that those children's education does not suffer due to the restrictions that have been necessary to control the virus on our island. Thank you. Uh, hearing you, um, if you could just, yep. uh, for the second question, yes, um, hearing uh, you talk about a student's education not suffering, some schools appear to have been delivering regular, lesson, regular lessons to their students online, yet there are reports suggesting other students have had minimal contact with their teachers and haven't been provided with any work. How are you, uh, are you of what tuition and lessons are available to students and what's being done to make it more consistent while many students are still out of the classroom? Yes, I mean, we've had to adapt very quickly to a health emergency and teachers have risen to the challenge in terms of diverting most of their teaching from in the classrooms to online. Now, the department has given a lot of guidance and um, advice to schools as they develop their own programmes. Some schools were already using quite a lot of online resources. Others have had to adapt to that. And GTS, the Government Technology Services, have equipped schools with the various platforms they need. Now, what we've been doing is working with head teachers, sharing best practice across the island to try to make sure we have much more consistency in terms of the online and remote learning that's available and the online teaching that's available. But if p parents do have concerns about the level, I'd really encourage them to get in contact with their head teachers because that feedback is incredibly important so that we can get the exact services we need for their children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. We now move on to Alex Bell from the BBC. Alex. Thank you, Chief Minister. Um, you, you mentioned there in the review of the repatriation process that there will be a criteria which will have to be met to allow a returning resident to self-isolate. But what criteria is this and would failing to meet it result in a quarantine upon return? Well, the criteria is if, if your house is occupied already with other people, then clearly you cannot go to that house because you could be bringing an illness to that household and there lies a risk. So if your house is empty, if, if, if you're a couple and you're coming back from holiday and your house is empty, then that's acceptable to go home to that house as long as that you can show that you have a network of support that will enable you to be brought food um, so that you do not have to leave that property because you cannot leave for 14 days. So if you cannot meet that criteria. We are not saying that you must go to purely the Comus. You can look to get a self-catering um, accommodation to move to or, or another hotel, but it must be approved by the Department of Enterprise as being up to a certain standard. Um, if you are on benefits, you will still be entitled to support during that time, but obviously the amount will be capped and that will be all put on our website today. Thank you. And for those who have already returned within the last three or four weeks, I think it is, will those who would have met that criteria to self-isolate be given refunds for their hotel stays? 
No, this is us moving forward. We can't do anything retrospectively. What we are saying, though, is that those that are currently in the comas, that on Wednesday, if they can comply with the guidelines of being able to self-isolate at home, then they will be allowed to do that, as well as the people coming on the boat on, on Wednesday. As I said, we are currently moving small steps at a time, and we cannot retrospectively... Um, do anything. We're just looking at how we can ease the situation. The medical advice is, is now supportive of this as a move and we have the data to back that, that up. But obviously it still has to be done in small groups and those people will have to totally self-isolate for the 14 days unless the only time they'll be allowed out of the house is if they have their own garden that adjoins the property and it's not shared with anyone else. Could I just ask as a point of clarification, please, for those who are allowed to leave the Comis Hotel early, will their remaining fee be paid? You, you got cut off then, but I think your question was, will their remaining fee be waived? And the answer yes. is yes. If they've already paid it up front, they will get it um, back from the government. And if they haven't paid Thanks. it, then um, they won't be liable to pay for the remaining week. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Alex. Next we, next, we have Jess Ward from Isle of Man Newspapers. Jess, good afternoon. Hello, Chief Minister. Um, my first question is for Dr Allenson, please. OK, and your second, because we've got a few people here. Do, do you want to oh, give me an indication? Also, also for Dr Allenson. Right, so both for Dr Allenson. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, so I've heard from a number of head teachers that they didn't know about the roadmap plan of getting mm -hmm. children back into schools. And we've just had the unions get in touch saying that they're not endorsing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so why, why didn't head teachers know about it? And, and do you think it's acceptable, the communication there? Well, I think the, the communication was acceptable. We sent the, the roadmap through to all the trade unions last weekend. So that's over seven days ago. And all head teachers also received a copy of it last Monday, so a week ago, to digest it and have a look at it in terms of a, a roadmap, a plan forward. So we have tried to take on board all their suggestions. The department have been meeting with all the various head teachers in terms of the, the clusters, north, south, east and west, to come up with a viable plan which then went before Comin and was discussed with public health and across government as a, as a strategic way that we could gradually phase children back. So as I said, all head teachers have had this document for the last seven days. The press release today was just to bring it out to the general public. And I think we need to make sure that actually parents are involved in some of these decisions as well. We're doing a lot of work with the staff, but we've also got to think about the families and children affected by this and trying to move forward with them as well. OK, it's just, it's just strikes me as odd that they're coming back and saying that they've just not had any communication and didn't know until it was announced at the weekend. I can, so. I can assure you that everyone was provided with the copy of the roadmap and actually this was discussed at one of the union meetings last Wednesday where they posed a series of questions on it that I'm due to respond to later on today. Okay, thank you. Um, for my second question, I just want to know on what scientific evidence and sociological modelling has the decision about when and how to open schools further been based on? So that's in terms of um, transmission of the virus between children and adults, as well as the capacity of schools and colleges to implement social distancing. Yeah. I, again, we've been trying to base as much of our, our strategy on clear evidence and clear um, research that's out there, but also on the advice of the clinical um, team and also, obviously, Dr Hewitt. I don't know, Dr Hewitt, would you like to come in at all with some of the scientific evidence based? Yes, yes, I can do. Um, the scientific evidence is of two sorts. One is drawing on experience in previous pandemics, so that would be around pandemic influenza and also the SARS epidemic back in the, the early 2000s. But of course, as time goes on, we're accruing more and more evidence about how COVID behaves and particularly how it behaves in different age groups. So we are now reasonably confident that actually COVID infection is seen much less frequently in children than it is in older age groups. And when it is seen, it tends to present with much milder symptoms than in adults. 
Now, where do children get infected? The evidence is now stronger and stronger that children get infected in households where someone else is already COVID positive. There isn't the evidence for this sort of spread within a school setting and then children taking it out of the school setting to spread further afield. And then finally, the final piece of evidence that again is getting stronger from, from multiple sources is that children spreading infection to adults is uncommon and that includes in the school setting. Um, and there have been one or two quite striking um, episodes based on particular outbreaks, for example, one in France where an infected child actually managed to attend three different schools while they were symptomatic. So they were coughing and, you know, creating droplet um, risk of infection. Across those three schools, they had 112 contacts, but there were no secondary cases in any of those. So all of that is making us more confident, not completely confident, obviously, because, you know, this is still an emerging um, illness that schools are relatively low risk and a low contributor to overall community spread and that brings me on to the third type of evidence which is where you go beyond the actual evidence to try and create some modeling scenarios that look at how much difference you would make if out of all your menu of things that you're restricting you either restricted or didn't restrict strict schools and the evidence there from that modelling is very much that the contribution that restricting schools makes is actually pretty low. And the estimate there has been to say that closing schools as opposed to not closing schools could potentially contribute only something like 2 to 4% in terms of reduction of mortality. So in your overall menu of things that you can do um, to control the spread of virus, the schools isn't high on the list and actually the wider social distancing and the hygiene measures are overall more important. Okay. But can, can I just say that obviously one of the key factors in terms of welcoming more children to school, a very strict criteria that if the, the child themselves have got any symptoms, they should stay at home. Similarly, any member of staff who has symptoms should stay at home. And as I said, we've got an accelerated testing procedure for all key staff now, so that if they do have symptoms or they've got a family member who have symptoms, they will be seen as priority and tested accordingly. Thank you. And thank you very much. Jess, we now move on to Amanda Cashmore from Jeff the Mongoose. Amanda. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. Last night, Boris Johnson announced that there will be a quarantine for those travelling into the UK from other countries. All Manx residents who are coming from further afield have to isolate for two weeks in the UK before they isolate again on the island. Well, obviously, the UK are very a little bit sketchy on their full detail yet. I, I, I've read the 50-page document today. I think on page 29 it tells you about international travel, where it mentions the Isle of Man as being exempt from our residents going into the United Kingdom. Now, obviously, uh, I, I have my regular um, weekly meetings with the United Kingdom government, and I have put over the situation of a Manx resident who's maybe trapped in India, eventually getting back to the UK, and I think it would be unreasonable for them to have to wait 14 days and then have to come back to the Isle of Man where we would insist on them having 14 days in quarantine. So I'm, I'm, I'm fairly cautiously confident that we will be able to have agreement that if you come into the United Kingdom and you're close to getting back to the Isle of Man, you will then go straight through our, 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 say our coach to, to the boat and then back to the Isle of Man. You won't have to do the full 14 days before you get moved. You know, it's, it's the same we do with anyone coming to the Isle of Man who wants to go back to the UK. Um, if they don't have to do the 14 days if they're going straight back to the boat. So this is obviously something we're working on at the moment with the United Kingdom government because they themselves do not know how they are going to 
exactly work this scheme but they have been very helpful in exempting the Isle of Man from any of our residents going to the UK and I'm cautiously optimistic that we will have a satisfactory outcome when they come up with their detail because they are aware of any perceived problems that the, uh, that the Isle of Man has already put forward to them and obviously my colleagues in Jersey and Guernsey have also stressed this point to Amanda. Thank you very much. And my second question is for Dr. Allenson, if that's OK. OK, Alex. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that there will be a teacher testing strategy. We've been told that the tests are less reliable if the person is not shedding the virus. Could, could you outline how the strategy might work? OK, so what we've done through public health is devise a key worker programme for um, Isle of Man government staff who are at risk perhaps of, of either getting coronavirus or maybe are essential staff who need to come back to work relatively soon. So with public health and the, the senior clinical group, the strategy is that if a member of staff has shown symptoms of coronavirus, they will be tested. Obviously, if that test is positive, they and their household will be asked to self-isolate for 14 days. But if that test is negative, then a further test will be done in 24 hours. And if that is negative as well, in somebody with symptoms, then it's very con conclusive that they do not have coronavirus and can come back to work. Similarly, if one of their family members has symptoms that might suggest coronavirus, rather than isolating the entire household, they again will be tested through the 111 number in the same way as, as the rest of the population, but with the impetus to make sure that we can keep essential services working, whether that be in our schools, our hospital or elsewhere. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Amanda. And now we move on to Tim Glover from Manx Radio. Tim. Pastor my Chief Minister, um, it's the Education Minister and the Health Minister, or the Health Minister and the Education Minister. OK, I'll leave them to decide which order they want to come in. David first. We'll give Alex a break for a minute, Tim, and I'll go first. Thank you, Minister. We heard from you this morning and you touched on uh, Abbotswood and the fact that the remaining residents there were going to be moved out of the home uh, tomorrow, I think was what you said. Can you just explain, because you said things have changed very quickly. What, what, what has changed to bring on this decision? Well, I'll give you a full response to it, Tim, if I may. Um, DHSC, first of all, has a le legal duty of care to the residents that are currently in the home. Our preference would have been and always has been for residents to remain at Abbotswood because we do recognise that this is their home and any move is difficult for residents, particularly around nursing care. With the number of investigations already underway regarding the circumstances that led to the suspension of Abbotswood licence, DHSC had asked for a suitable proposal in order to consider keeping residents in the home. As we have to remember, we don't own the building. So in order to operate out of that, we require a lease arrangement. We did receive terms, but to be quite frank, those terms were unacceptable and not value for money for the taxpayer. And DHSC cannot continue to provide services from a building without any lease or any other contractual arrangement in place, including the fact that there's urgent remedial works in order to secure the safety of residents that needed doing beyond the next few days. So our priority now is to safely transfer the remaining residents and we will then carefully work with families to identify future new nursing and residential homes to meet their individual needs. I know there's also been some questions about what engagement have the families had, so I'd just like to engage, actually to raise that now. So in terms of engagement with the families of those residents that are still in Abbotswood, the department contacted families direct at the earliest opportunity. There was a conference call attempted with all the families on Saturday, which due to technological issues, as we even sometimes see at this press conference, didn't actually work out. So instead, the chief executive of the department rang each individual family in person to talk through with them and answer questions. And families have also been written to by the department, and I believe a further letter will be going later today. So, of course, families will be involved in any decisions around long-term care and the placement of their loved ones, and those conversations will have to be ongoing. 
Thank you. If I could speak to Dr. Alex Allen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We only got a statement 15 minutes or so before the press conference started from seven unions who are saying they have not had regular meetings with teachers and unions in the lead up to the production of this document, that is the uh, roadmap for education, and it's misleading of government to suggest otherwise. The roadmap is lacking in practical support and guidelines and raises more questions than it answers. The joint unions therefore consider the document flawed and unworkable. Wouldn't it have been best to talk to uh, the official reps from the unions before producing the roadmap, and then you'd all be steering in the one direction. Well, talks have been ongoing with all the union representatives, but also with those teachers on the ground who are providing services at the moment through the hubs. And if I can just say, in terms of the roadmap, as I said, that, that was circulated to all the unions and the teachers over a week ago. They've had a discussion with it, and it is just that. It is a roadmap. It is a way we can move forward together. But it's not the full picture. We've also produced work in terms of physical distancing in schools, in terms of hygiene levels in schools, in terms of hand washing. And just to put it into context, even this week, we have another JNC, which will last for several hours with all the unions. There are also going to be cluster meetings between the department and all those head teachers who are still operating the schools, and also a separate meeting with the secondary heads to discuss a way that we can move forward. We are going through uncharted territory. We are having to work together to have a consistent way of moving forward. And as I said, the roadmap is a very good skeleton of this, but there is further work happening as we speak. There's further work that's been done on top of that to actually work together. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I'm more than happy to talk to the unions and all the representatives of the teaching profession and the other professions that keep our schools open. But we also need to concentrate on the families and the pupils that are going into those schools and bear them in mind as well. Thank you. Just a supplementary, uh, okay. if I may, on that. Certainly. The unions say, or the head teachers say, they asked specifically from their COVID uh, support group meeting a number of questions of yes. your department and they've not had answers yet. Well, they asked the questions on Wednesday and sent them through to me on Wednesday night. I've been liaising with public health about some of the answers, and some of them were contained within other documentation. Others were, for instance, if a pupil became unwell at the school, what procedures would be put into place? We now have those procedures, and I will be sending out the three-page response to their specific questions later on today when I finish this news conference. Thank you. And thank you very much, Tim. We now move on to Rob at 3FM. Rob. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Chief Minister. Uh, my two questions are also for Dr Allenson, please. OK. Alex. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Minister. Um, first off, with regards to this roadmap, plenty of talk there about how it's been circulated to teachers and unions in whichever way. But you've also mentioned trying to get parents involved. How prudent would it be then to make this information more available to the public so that if parents can peruse this and see what the details are, even if it's a living document, they can give their own feedback on what they think should be happening because it'll be their, their children going back at the end of the day at some point. No, absolutely. I mean, the roadmap was, was produced to try to give a rough idea of how we would move forward, but without any dates in it, because obviously we need to look at the health situation, what develops on, on the Isle of Man, whether for good or if we have any increase in cases. So we're more than happy to make, to make that public. I think also that there's a need to get parents more involved. And perhaps as we go through this process, um, we could think about um, some, some focus groups being set up with parents and, the repre and their representatives so we can chart the best way for to moving forward. Safety and well-being of all the pupils and staff has to be paramount, but also we need to try to overcome the fear that parents have about bringing their children back into school. And one of the best ways of this is to use the evidence and present that in a clear way, but obviously the dialogue and reassurance is also an incredibly important part as we move out of the restrictions that we're currently in. Thank you. My second question touches on actually what you've just mentioned right at the end there. You just spoke about the key year groups, the likes of years two to six and years 10 to 12, going back on whichever date, like you said, there are no dates yet. But at the same time, once that is announced, there may be parents and guardians who feel 
anxious and under pressure to send their children back, but they simply don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. So what support's going to be available for them if they just aren't comfortable, yeah. whenever, whatever date it is, with sending their children back? Yeah. I, I think one, one of the key things on, on the Isle of Man that perhaps hasn't um, got through in the United Kingdom is that right at the start of the health emergency, the Department of Education, Sport and Culture said that we would change some of the regulations so we would not make it obligatory for parents to send their children to school. If they didn't have that confidence, there'd be no sanction on them if they wanted to keep their child at home. And what we've been trying to do is work with all the teachers, with all the schools, to really maximise the amount of remote learning, online teaching and online resources that are, that are available. But we know that there are some children who may not be able to come back to school in the near future because of pre-existing medical conditions. And also some key members of staff who, for medical conditions, have to self-isolate and shield. So it's vitally important we support them through good online teaching and actually make them feel part of the wider educational community. So those teachers who can work from home will continue to do that. Those pupils who may need to be taught at home, we can support them through that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I move on, I'd just like to point out that the level of infection rates on the Isle of Man compared with the level of infection rates in the United Kingdom are considerably different. And therefore, we would hope that we can come up with solutions that give the protection to our teachers, our young people, and the reassurance to the families of, of our young people. Right, we move now on to Simon Richardson from Business 365 magazine. Simon. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. My questions are for you, please. Um, the first one, a different subject. Uh, police say they were concerned at the number of people gathering on some proms and beaches at the weekend. How worried are you about this? And do you think it likely that strict uh, lockdown measures may have to be reintroduced if these problems persist? Well, I know that the, 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 the police feel that um, some people haven't been following the rules and regulations. Now, fortunately for us at this moment in time, the data isn't showing a, a, an increased spread in the, um, of the coronavirus, but we cannot be complacent. We are looking as a Council of Ministers at making changes to ease the situation for families, for businesses to get back to work. That can only go ahead if people are responsible and respect the distancing, stay at home where possible, keep two metres away from your friends or, or people that are out walking, and to also make sure that you wash your hands on a regular basis in a hot soapy water. Now, if people don't respect that and we see a slight increase in the spike, then we won't have the confidence to make life easier for the people of the Isle of Man and enable businesses to get back to work. So really it's in everyone's interests to follow the rules, not to be complacent. Yes, we are in a good place at this moment in time, but we cannot be complacent. We're only in this good place because people have followed the rules. And therefore I urge people to ensure they follow the rules and to respect the social distancing when they are out and about. And I thank you very much, Simon, for raising that really important question. And your second question. Secondly, a similar, yeah, a similar theme, actually, Chief Minister. I don't know if you're as confused about what's happening in the UK as the rest of us, but are you happy that the police officers here have clear guidelines on how to police the easing of the lockdown rules? It seems that in the UK there's real concern that a challenging job is becoming virtually impossible due to the mixed messages from above. Well, it's, it's not my policy or style to comment on other jurisdictions, how they're handling their situation. We've tried our utmost to make it as clear as possible. When we moved from stay at home to stay safe, we obviously tried to come up with a clear message to people that whilst we were trusting them to... Um, be responsible people, and they have the vast, vast majority of our public, our great Manx public, have done a fantastic job. It is still a very small number of people who are not being responsible, and as a result, our police have, have st are still having to take people to court, and they have issued a number of spot f uh, you know, on, on, the, on the spot fines. They don't want to do that. They give people warnings before, but if you're a persistent offender, you will be prosecuted or you will get an on-the-spot fine. So I think our police have taken a very pragmatic approach and I would be disappointed if 
they don't understand where we're coming from. Obviously, the Minister of Home Affairs sits in the Council of Ministers and we do our best. We've had the Chief Constable in here a couple of times now to, to have a talk about how he's, he sees things happening on the Isle of Man. So I think we are in a good position with, with our police force and the policing of social distancing. But I really don't like commenting about all the jurisdictions. That's for them. I'm here to look after the people of the Isle of Man. Thank you very much. Um, Simon, Thank you. we now move on to Mr Paul Moulton of MTTV. Paul. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, my question's for Mr Ashford, both of them. So if okay. I could have him, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Yeah, no problems. David. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon, Minister. I need to return to the nursing homes. I've had a lot of people onto me and uh, things, especially obviously Abbots Wood, uh, I, I, I'm limited, I know what I can ask you here, but is it true that when they get moved tomorrow, they go to Newlands, which is only a halfway house, and these people will then be moved again to the final place? I think we have covers, but there's an incredible amount of worry from the staff because they know these patients so well. And you, again, you know, we've talked about how this can really upset them. Is this the, really the best way, not going direct from one place to another rather than to go through a middle place which just puts more pressure on these poor patients? Unfortunately, Paul, there's not the time to be able to do a direct changeover because, as I just explained when I answered the question for Tim before, the HSC cannot continue to operate out of a home that it has no, rent, no agreement, no lease agreement to be able to operate from. So we have no choice but to do it in intermittent steps. The thing I need to make clear, though, is that the DHS, uh, DHSC staff that have been in the home, that have been working with them, that those staff will be transferring with the patients. So we will be utilising both Newlands and what was previously the private patient's unit that has also been set up to be able to cope with admissions there. But there is no, pra no practical way of, be of being able to go straight from Abbotswood into other homes. This is something that okay. needs to be done in a proper managed way for the sake of those residents. None of this is ideal. As I said in my opening statement, the ideal solution would have been for them to be able to stay put, but an agreement has not been able to be reached. And on, on that, some have been potentially put into the COVID ward at Newlands and they have no sign of it and they've been tested. And, and there's been reaction all day today about that. Well, well, hang, hang on, Paul. Let's just be very clear here. I've just said that it's split between Newlands and the PPU. We will not be just placing people who haven't got COVID into a COVID ward. That actually is not going to well, happen. That's what, they, that's what the relatives were told. So, I mean, they're well, really going what. Well, I'm sorry, was, that's not what they've been told. And also, right. you, you're not quite understanding the setup of Newlands either and how it's laid out there. OK. And, and, and you know, you did bring out that big uh, statement when questioned by Tim about. Uh, Abbott's word. Why didn't you just say that in the first place? Why would you have to be pushed to make that information? It seemed to me that this is a press conference and that was very much part of what you could have said at the beginning. If we hadn't asked you about Abbott's word, you may not have even read that statement. Well, one of the things I've made quite clear, Paul, all along with Abbott's word, is things will be released when, as and when they're asked for. We're not just going to proactively go out with a load of information. What's important is, what is, is dealing with the families. It's the families that matter and also, obviously, the people within Abbotswood. They are the people we are communicating with primarily. Now, I know there's a lot of public interest in what happens with Abbotswood, and if I'm asked a direct question, I will give an honest answer to it. But the primary communication is with the families and also the patients within Abbotswood. OK, and, and my other question to do this other nursing home um clearly now we all i know where it is you know where it is you, you say you still can't make it public but it, it sent everyone running off to make phone calls frantically making sure their loved ones are okay i hear that only half the people have been tested within the complex and the person that was tested positive has been moved to newlands yes yes the person who was tested positive has been moved to newlands i think i said that in answer to the question um at the last press conference where this was raised um in relation to those who've been tested the people who've been tested are those that would have been in contact contact with that individual, um, I, which again, I'm pretty certain I said at that press conference that we'd done testing in, in the home, targeted testing in relation to people who would have been in contact with that individual. And all of those tests have come back negative. But you wouldn't want to test everybody then? Well, not if they've not been into and not been in, in contact with that person, Paul, no because there'd be no point in testing people who haven't well, had okay. any contact well, it's a whatsoever. nursing home, I'm sure, that by the very nature of it, things transfer, don't they? So, but yeah. the key point is, okay. all the tests that have been done have come back negative. If we'd started getting all the positive cases, 
then obviously that would change the picture. But we've not had any other positive cases confirmed. And, and sorry for taking so much time, but were those tests that proved negative, were they sent off for Manchester for double checking because you were a bit worried, not you, but people were worried that they had to all come back negative? No, 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 Paul, we don't need to do double checking. We have a proper test centre here, up and running, that has been validated all along. We don't need to start sending things off for double checking. They have come back as negative. Thank you very much. And finally, we have Josh from ITV. Josh. Thank you, Chief Minister. Uh, one for the Health Minister and then one for yourself as well, please, if that's OK. OK. Do you want to come back, David? Hi, Josh. Hi, Minister. Just just one final question on Abbotswood. Um, were the other care homes consulted on this decision, along with the families of residents in those care homes, and are they fully on board with allowing these residents in? And has there been any reassurance given there to those people? Well, the first thing that needs to be said is anyone transferring to another um, care home would not do so in line with the testing strategy unless they have been tested and returned a negative result. So it's not just a case of moving people um, from Abbotswood um, into, into Newlands, even if they're currently not diagnosed, and then just going into a care home. We would test them beforehand um, to make absolutely sure they were negative. Um, I have spoken to a couple of homes who ended up contacting me over the weekend. They certainly were on board, the couple I spoke to. Um, but no, we haven't proactively gone out because we need to make sure that we get the needs of each individual patient right first. Thank you. And now for me, Joshua. Yeah, thank you, Chief Minister. Um, one of the new recommendations from the UK is that people should now be wearing a face covering when entering places like shops and public transport. Has there been a reconsideration on whether the same advice could apply here? I know we're talking about different scales and different jurisdictions, but surely people in a shop in the UK can be compared to people who are entering a shop in the Isle of Man. And therefore, is the advice any different? Right, well, I haven't received any differing advice on that topic at the moment. Obviously, the UK have only made this announcement, but I think I'll bring in our Director of Public Health, Henrietta, to see if she'd like to clarify that position. Yes, in fact, uh, we took through guidance on just that. It must be coming up three weeks ago now. And if you look at the government's COVID website, you will find guidance on the use of face masks in the community. And that makes it very clear that the evidence is that wearing a simple face mask or face covering, so not a medical grade one, um, can reduce the risk of unwitting transmission by somebody who has symptoms but ha who does not have symptoms. An asymptomatic person who is carrying the virus, if they wear a face covering, that can reduce their transmission. It doesn't protect them. So wearers of face masks are not protected, but by wearing one, you can protect others. So the guidance on the website um, says that people may wish to consider whether to wear a simple face mask or face covering in crowded situations where social distancing is going to be difficult. So potentially in a crowded shop or on public transport. And that guidance has been up on the government website for some time now. So just to be clear, because obviously the UK government seemed to have moved into advising it and almost pushing it to say this is the right thing to do. What is the Isle of Man government's stance? Is it this is what you should be doing or this is what you could be doing? It's, this is what it could be doing, because that is where we believe the evidence currently sits at the moment. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much, Josh, for your question. Before I go, um, I won't be doing any shout outs today. It's been a long, long briefing today. But before I go, um, a quick look at the week ahead. Things are, of course, subject to change. But as things stand, tomorrow we will be marking International Nurses Day, which this year also marks the 200th anniversary of Florence Nightingale's birth. On Wednesday, we would like to focus on questions relating to health and safety at work. Thursday, I hope to take you through decisions taken at the Council of Ministers that morning, and we will also update you on infrastructure matters. And Friday, we will focus on cyber security. So please keep tuning in, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, visit our website. Remember the basics that have got us here. Stay in if you can, and if you can't, and if you do go out, please respect other people's space in the same way that you want them to respect yours. Have a good week.
Be proud of what you have achieved. We have a long way to go, but we have achieved a lot. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.